Chapter 3 A Friend of the Masses. I long to reach some small portion of the masses so that in the position not of a teacher but of a friend, I may lay open real happiness to them. Lippmann to Lucio Elsas, 1908. The subtle lure of Santiana's new platonic essences was rudely shattered for Lippmann during the spring of his second year at Harvard. A week before Easter 1908, a fair ravaged the slums of the nearby city of Chelsea, leaving thousands homeless. He joined a brigade of Harvard students to volunteer to help the victims. Although he had spent some time working with underprivileged children at a Hill House, a Boston settlement, this was his first experience with poor people. The working class had been an uh, abstraction. Anonymous janitors, policemen, shop clerks, as he roamed the smoldering tenements, he saw poverty for the first time as a human reality. On returning to the yard, he began to relate what he had seen to the social criticism he had been reading. Shaw's plays and Wells' novels took on a different meaning. Until then, his social concern had been sentimental and literary. Now he began to question the system that produced such inequality. He began to relate it to socialism. The subject was daring even at Harvard and unthinkable in the social world he had come from. A world in which, as he later wrote, the name of the Democrat like a grower Cleveland was uttered with a monstrous dread in the household, and where William Jennings' brand was a orgy from the West. He read the Communist Manifesto and some of Karl Marx's shorter essays, but disliked the emphasis on class struggle and felt that inciting the masses to mob actions was not a desirable way to bring about a better society. Like most children of the Progressive Era, he wanted to make society more equitable not turn it upside down. In search of a reform without revolution, he found that he wanted in the British Fabians, organized in the 1880s by Beatrice and Sidney Webb, the Fabian Society had attracted an impressive group of writers and intellectuals, including H.G. Wells and George Bernard Shaw, preaching moderation, emphasizing education, and confining their membership to a small group of the enlightened, the Fabians took just enough of a Marx to be modern, while eliminating everything that threatened social stability. Convinced that nothing constructive could be done by the masses, they favored the creation of a small core of a selfless leaders, what Wells had called a new mass of capable men, mostly scientists and engineers with a strong imperative to duty. Subordinating their appetites to the service of the state, these men and women would surmount the inefficiency and prejudices of a popular democracy. Fabianism appealed to intellectuals like Lippmann because it so perfectly expressed the desire of the middle-class reformer to level up rather than to level down, to transform the poor into contented bourgeois rather than to seize the state apparatus, and to put power in the hands of an intellectual elite. Lippmann borrowed into the stacks of a college library, 
devouring the Fabian texts, the Web's industrial democracy, and the report on the poor laws, the novels of Wells, the political essays of Shaw and H. N. Hadman. From these, he delved into the futurist classics, William Morris's News from Nowhere, Thomas Moore's Utopia, and Edward Balmy's Looking Backward. After hearing a talk on socialism at a finale hall, he had been walking on air all day. He told Lucille, "Isn't it a thing great enough to make you feel like getting down on your knees and worshiping man to find that in the center of American conservatism, people are today discussing the fundamental errors of?" Errors of our government. A week later, he announced his conversion. I have come around to socialism as a creed. He told Lucio, "I do believe in it passionately and fearlessly. Not that all men are equal, for that is a misapplication of a democracy. I believe that the people must express themselves in the organized society." Where religion is the dynamic, the young convert's questioning of equality was characteristically Fabian, as was the equating of religion with justice, progress, and efficiency. His social conscience aroused by the Chelsea Fair and his intellect engaged by the Fabian tracks. Lippmann worked closely with a socialist discussion group at Harvard. In March 1908, he and eight undergraduates had formed the Socialist Club to consider, according to his manifesto, all schemes of social reform which aimed at a radical reconstruction of a society. The group unanimously elected Lippmann, its organizer and the most effective debater. As president, in its first official action, the club applied for a charter from the Intercollegiate Socialist Society (ISS), a coordinating body founded by Clarence Darrow and Jack London in 1905. The budding Fabians set up a reference library in Harrow. Model Wells dormitory room, and every other week held meetings to discuss papers written by the members on equality and injustice. If anyone taking a bird's eye view of the Cambridge at one o'clock in the morning were to see five or six groups of excited Harvard men gesticulating wildly. On various street corners, Lippmann wrote in the article for a school magazine, "Let him know that the Socialist Club hold a meeting that evening." In addition to gesticulating wildly, the young socialists also invited speakers such as Lincoln Stephens, the muckraker journalist, Florence Kelly. Head of the National Consumers League and a pioneer of the women's movement, Marissa Hillquid of the Socialist Party, James McKay, McKay, author of *The Economy of Happiness*, and such local writers as Charles Jubilin and Bill Flower. William James extended his blessing, while George. Santayana and Rav Baron Perry came to speak. For Harvard, where the annual Hasty Pudding Show was still the leading undergraduate activity, the Socialist Club was a daring iconoclasm. He who listens carefully enough, Lippmann wrote in an effort to tantalize his fellow students, will hear at Harvard. Heresies about private property, which ten years ago would have been denounced by the public press as leading straight to atheism, to free love, 
and all the other horrors that a terrified ignorance can conjure up. Not content to debate issues, the young socialists challenged the university to stop exploiting ill-paid workers, permit women speakers, and offer full credit for a course in socialism. They even reached beyond Howard Square, drawing up a socialist platform for municipal elections and introducing bills into the state legislature. Their aim was to overcome what Lippmann described as the suffocating discretions, the reservations, and the bland silence of college life. Fired by his new faith, he helped found the social polit politics club, joined the debating club and the philosophical club, wrote for the political Harvard Illustrated, edited by his uh, classmate Carlton Bohr, and for the more library Harvard Monthly, for the more literary Harvard Monthly, then under the direction of uh, Edward I. Hunt, his uh, socialist comrade. He became part of a group of uh, rebel agitators whose uh, aim, in John Reed's words, was to make undergraduates take sides, grow angry, to split the university in size on every question. I'm very happy, Walter wrote Lucio of his work at the Cambridge Social Union, because it gives me the opportunity to work in the exact field I long to, to reach some small portion of the masses so that in the position not of a teacher but of a friend, I may lay open real happiness to them. As he developed confidence in himself as a writer, he turned out a stream of articles for the school magazines extolling the superiority of socialism, decrying the commercialism of college athletes, and defending the women's movement. He said, they are unladylike just as the Boston Tea Party was ungentlemanly, and our civil war bad form. He wrote of the suffragettes, but unfortunately in this world, great issues are not won by good manners. He even took on A. Lawrence Lowell, who had succeeded Charles Eliot as president of Harvard in 1909, for decreeing that a freshman could no longer live in the same buildings as upper-class men, this he charged discriminated in favor of the opulent private dormitories on Mount Auburn Street and meant the gro grouping of men by the amount of rent they are willing to pay by fashion or tradition, the reproduction at Harvard of the same social stratification which exists in the world. Although the Socialist Club had 50 members by the fall of 1909, most undergraduates remained indifferent to the great political issues. We move in a political, a political darkness, Lieberman complained in the monthly. We fail to grasp the overwhelming duties that freedom imposes on the individual. Our conscience are not social. We are hopelessly private persons. There was nothing wrong in being dissatisfied, he told the undergraduate, but it was uh, decidedly ridiculous for young men to be conservative, for it means that they will probably be stand patterns, patterns. When they grow older, men who are orthodox when they are young are in danger of being middle-aged all their lives. He even tried to activate younger boys, join the sleepy political clubs and wake them up. He wrote in an article for his old school paper, make them count for what they ought to count in college life. You will do your studying eagerly because it will seem to have a connection with interesting and important events. Eager to make that connection himself, 
he did not confine his socialist activities to Harvard. As an effective public speaker, his delivery refined from years of training as a debater. He was greatly in demand at other socialist clubs and was often called on by the Intercollegiate Socialist Society. When the ISS held its first convention in New York early in 1910, Lippmann was a, a featured speaker. Later that year, he joined the executive committee and toured other campuses to give a pep talks. 